Well, hello. Welcome back to uh, Mr. Brackman in the Brackman house here. And we're reading through our book, The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963. Last time we talked about one of the awards this book received, this book also received an award called the Newberry Award. Now, the Newberry Award is given out to one book each year that best distinguishes itself as the most outstanding book of American children's literature for that year. And in the year 2000, the book that we're reading also got the Newberry Award. So this is a multi-award winning book that we're reading through. And I'm so excited that you're able to join me as we read through it together. We're moving on to chapter three as we follow 10-year-old Kenny in his adventures at school and at home with his family, the Watsons. So let's jump right in. I couldn't believe it. The door opened in the middle of math class and the principal pushed the older raggedy kid in. You remember, this is the one of the boys that Kenny got to meet on the bus in chapter two. Mrs. Cordell said, boys and girls, we have a new student in our class starting today. His name is Rufus Fry. Now, I know all of you will help make Rufus feel welcome, won't you? Someone sniggled. Good. Rufus, say hello to your new classmates, please. He didn't smile or wave or anything. He just looked down and said real quiet, hi. A couple of girls thought he was cute because they said, hi, Rufus. Why don't you sit next to Kenny and he can help you catch up with what we're doing, Miss Cordell said. I couldn't believe it. I, wa I wanted my personal savior to be as far away from me as he could. I knew when you had two people who were going to get teased a lot and they were close together, people didn't choose one of them to tease. They picked on both of them. And instead of picking on them the normal amount, they picked on them twice as much. And again, I'm so glad for you that you don't pick on students at our school. Miss Cordell pushed the new kid over to the empty seat next to me. Kenny, show Rufus where you are in the book. I watched the new kid sideways. He said, Kenny, I thought they said your name was Poindexter. The class cracked up, part from his country style of talking and part from laughing at me. I could tell that even Miss Cordell was fighting not to break out laughing. Though he was looking friendly when he said this, I kind of knew it had to be teasing because whoever heard of anybody's mama giving him a name like Poindexter. When he sat down next to me, I tried to imitate Byron's death stare, but it didn't work because the kid smiled at me with a real big smile and said, my name's Rufus. What are we doing? Times tables. That's easy. You need some help? No, I said, and scooted around in my chair so all he could do was look at my back. This guy was real desperate for a friend because even though I wouldn't say much back to him, he kept jabbering away at me all through class. When lunchtime came, he followed me outside right to the part of the playground where I sit to eat. He forgot about bringing a lunch, so I gave him one of Mama's throat-choking peanut butter sandwiches and let him eat the last half of my apple. He really was a strange kid. He only ate half the sandwich, folded the rest up in the wax paper, and when I handed him the apple, he even ate the spots where you could see my teeth had been. He didn't even wipe the slob off first. And man, this kid could really talk. He was yakking a mile a minute talking about stuff like, your mama sure can make a good peanut butter sandwich, and how come 
these kids are so darn mean. Then he said something that made me get all funny and nervous inside. He said, how come your eyes ain't looking in the same way? I looked to see, see if maybe this was the start of some teasing, but he looked like he really wanted to know. He wasn't staring at me either. He was kind of looking down and kicking at the dirt with his raggedy shoes. It's a lazy eye. He stopped kicking the dirt and said, don't it hurt? And I said, no. He said, oh, then kicked a little more dirt and I hollered out, oh boy, look at how fat that there is. What, what? You don't see that squirrel? He asked me and pointed at a tree across the street. That sure is one fat, dumb squirrel. I looked at the squirrel. It didn't look fat or dumb to me. It was just a regular old squirrel sitting on a branch, chewing on something. How come you think it's dumb? What kind of squirrel sits in the open like that with folks all around? That squirrel wouldn't last two seconds in Arkansas. I'd have picked him off as easy as anything. The new kid pointed at the squirrel with his finger like it was a gun and said, Bang! Squirrel stew for dinner. You mean you shot a gun before? Ain't you? You mean you really ate squirrel before? You ain't? A real, real gun? Just a twenty-two. How's a squirrel taste? It tastes real good. You mean you really shoot them with real bullets and then you really eat them? Why else shoot them? Real squirrels, like that one. Not that fat and not that stupid. I guess all the fat, stupid ones been got already. Since I was born, all that's left in Arkansas is skinny, sneaky ones. I think the Michigan squirrels is worse than two Arkansas ones. You ain't lying? He raised his hand and said, I swear for God. Ask Cody. Who? The little shrunk up version of the new kid was standing by himself up against a fence that runs around Clark, watching us. The new kid waved at him. And his little brother came running over. The big one pointed over at the squirrel. Cody, look at there. Cody laughed and said, oh boy, that sure is a fat squirrel. Think you could pick him off from here? Cody pointed his finger like it was a gun and said, Bang, squirrel, stew tonight. Couldn't believe the little kid had shot a gun, too. You shot a real gun? Just a twenty-two, With real bullets? The little one looked at his big brother to see why I was asking all this stuff. It seemed like they were trying to be patient with me, like I was a real dummy or something. The older one said, tell him. Yeah, there was real bullets. What else are you going to shoot out of a gun? Still couldn't believe them, but the bell rang and lunch was over. I knew he didn't think I noticed, but the big kid gave the little brother the other half of my sandwich. I guess both of them forgot their lunch. Maybe because they were really old clothes, they just can't afford to make a lunch to bring to school. This saver stuff wasn't going anything like I thought it was supposed to. Rufus started acting like I was his friend. In the morning on the bus, he'd always come and sit next to me. Miss Cordell put his regular seat next to mine at school. Every day at lunchtime, he followed me out of the playground, ate half my school sandwich, and then sneaked the other half to Cody. He even found out where we lived and started coming over every night around 5.30. Didn't mind him coming over to play because both our favorite game was playing with the little plastic dinosaurs that I had and you couldn't really have any fun playing by yourself. That was because someone had to be the American dinosaurs and someone had to be the Nazi ones. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Rufus didn't seem to mind being the Nazi dinosaurs most of the time, and it was okay playing with him 
because he didn't cheat and he didn't try to steal any of my plastic monsters. The only other guy that I used to play with was L.J. Jones, but I kept quit playing with him when a lot of my dinosaurs started disappearing. Got about a million of them. But before L.J. started coming over, I had about two million. It's kind of embarrassing when L.J. got them from me. At first, he'd steal them one at a time, and I asked Byron what I should do to stop it, and he said, Don't sweat it, punk. The way I figure it, one or two of them stupid little monsters ain't a real high price for you to pay to get someone to play with. But L.J. wasn't satisfied with doing one or two. I guess he wanted a raise. So one day he said to me, You know, we should stop having these little fights all the time. We need to have one great big dinosaur battle. Yeah, we could call out all the world's greatest dinosaurs and have a world's greatest dinosaur war ever, I said. But I get to be the American dinosaurs. I should have known something was fishy when LJ said, okay. But I get first shot. Most of the time, it always took a big fight to decide who had to be the Nazis. I started setting up my dinosaurs and LJ said, this ain't right. If it really is the world's greatest dinosaur war ever, we need more monsters. You should go get the rest of them. He was right. If we were going to be a famous battle, we needed more fighters. Okay, I'll be right back. This wasn't going to be easy. I wasn't allowed to take all my dinosaurs out at once because Mama was afraid I'd lose some of them. Especially because she didn't trust LJ. Every time he'd come over, she'd tell me, you watch out for that boy. He's a little too sneaky for my taste. I had a plan, though. I'd go upstairs and drop the pillowcase I kept my dinosaurs in out the window. I wasn't so stupid that I'd drop them down to LJ. I'd drop them out the window on the other side of the house and run outside and get them. My plan worked perfectly. As I went and picked up the pillowcase, I set up my dinosaurs and LJ set up the Nazi dinosaurs and we started the battle. He took first shot and killed 30 of mine with an atomic bomb. My dinosaurs shot back and got 20 of his with a hand grenade. The battle was going great. Dinosaurs were falling right and left and center. We had a great big pile of dead ones off to the side and had to keep shaking more and more reinforcements out of the pillowcase. Then in the middle of one of the big fights, LJ said, wait a minute, Kenny, there's something we forgot about. I was ready for a trick. I knew J LJ was going to try to get me to go away for a moment so he could steal a bunch of my monsters. And I said, well, what? These dinosaurs have been dropping atomic bombs on each other. Think about how dangerous that is. How's it dangerous, LJ said. Look, he made one of the brontosauruses run up to the pile of dead dinosaurs, and when he got two steps past them, started shaking and twitching and fell over on the side, dead as a donut. LJ flipped him over on the dead dinosaur pile. I said, what happened to him? It was the radioactiveness. We got to bury the dead ones before they infect the rest of the live ones. Maybe it was because we had such a great war going on that I was kind of nervous. Oh, excuse me, I have a tickle in my throat about who'd win. But this stupid stuff made sense. So instead of digging each one of the couple hundred dead dinosaurs a grave, we dug one giant hole and buried all the radioactive ones in there. Put a big rock on top so no radioactivity would leak out. This really was the world's greatest dinosaur war ever. We fought and killed dinosaurs for such a long time that we had to make two more graves with two more big rocks on top of them. LJ finally pulled the trick I knew he was going to but he did it in such a cool way that I didn't even see it coming. Oh, no. Kenny, you ever been over in Banky and Lara Dunn's fort? LJ knew I hadn't. Uh-uh. Find out where it is. Where? You want to come see it? Are you crazy? They ain't there. This is Thursday night. 
stay up in the community center playing ball. Really? Well, if you're too scared. I knew this was a worm with a hook on it, but I bit anyway. I'm not scared if you aren't. Let's go. Figured the trick would come in right here, so I kept a real good eye on LJ while we put my monsters back in the pillowcase. Then we were done, sneaked a look in his back pockets, because I knew when he stole dinosaurs, he put them back there or in his socks. From the way his pockets were sticking out, it looked like he had one Tyrannosaurus Rex and one Triceratops. I couldn't tell how many he had in his socks. I figured that wasn't too bad a price for such an amount of fun that we'd had. LJ was talking a mile a minute. They even got some books in their fort. I like books. I wasn't sure if LJ believed me or not, though. LJ said, you got to be in the house by seven, don't you? Yeah. Okay, well, we better hurry before it gets too late. After I sneaked the dinosaurs back in the house, we ran off toward Banky and Larry Dunn's secret force. It wasn't until nine o'clock at night when I was in bed that a bell went off in my head. I'd forgotten about the radioactive dinosaurs. <clears throat> I put on my tennis shoes, got my night reading flashlight, climbed out the back window, and went down the tree into the backyard. I got to the battleground and saw the three radioactive graves. But when I moved the rock on the first one and dug a little bit, I didn't hit one dinosaur, not one. The second grave was empty too. Didn't even move the rock from the third one. I just sat there and felt real stupid. It's probably sad too that the other boy took all his dinosaurs. I couldn't help thinking about Sunday school again. I remembered the story of how a bunch of angels came down and rolled away a rock that was in front of Jesus' grave to let him go to heaven. I think it took them three days to push the rock far enough so he could squeeze out. My dinosaurs weren't even in their graves for three hours before someone rolled their rocks away. Maybe it was a lot easier for a bunch of angels to get a million dinosaurs to heaven than it was to get the savior of the whole world out. But I wish they'd given me a couple more hours. But I was just making excuses to myself for being so stupid. I knew if a detective had looked at these rocks, he would have found a clue of a single angel being there. But I'd bet a million bucks he'd have seen that those rocks were covered with a ton of L.J. Jones fingerprints. Never played with L.J. again after that. So playing with Rufus got to be okay. It was a lot better not to have to worry about getting stuff stolen when you're with your friends. It was a lot better not spending half the time arguing about who's going to be the Nazi dinosaurs. I was wrong when I said that me and Rufus being near each other all the time would make people tease both of us twice as much. People started leaving me alone and just going after Rufus. It was easy for them to do that because he was kind of like me. He had two things wrong with him too. Do you remember the two things that Kenny said were wrong with him? The first thing wrong with Rufus was the way he talked. After he said that hi y'all stuff on the bus, he got to be famous for it. And no matter how much he tried to talk in a different way, people wouldn't let him forget what he'd said. The other thing wrong with him was his clothes. Didn't take people long before they counted how many pair of pants and shirts Rufus and Cody had. It was easy to do because Rufus only had two shirts, two pair of pants. Cody only had three shirts and two pair of pants. 
they also had one pair of blue jeans that they switched off on. Some days Rufus wore them, some days Cody rolled up the legs and put them on. It's really funny how something as stupid as a pair of blue jeans can make you feel real, real bad. But that's what happened to me. We had been sort of secret friends for a couple of weeks before people really started getting onto them about not having a bunch of clothes. Me and Rufus said Cody were on the bus seat behind the driver one day and Larry Dunn walked up to our seat and said, country cornflake. I noticed how you and your little flake switch off on them pants. I don't know if Friday is your day to wear them, but I was wondering if the same person who gets to wear the pants gets to wear the drawers on that day too. It's really mean. Of course, the whole bus started laughing and hollering. Larry Dunn went back to his seat real quick before the driver had a chance to tell everyone the secret he knew about Larry's mama. He looked over, I looked over at Cody. He had the blue jeans on today and was pulling the waist out to check out his underpants. Maybe it was because everyone else was laughing. Maybe it was because Cody had such a strange look on his face while he peeked at his underpants. Maybe it was because I was glad that Larry hadn't jumped me. But for whatever the reason, I cracked up laughing too. Rufus shot a look at me. His face never changed, but I knew right away I'd done something wrong. I tried to squeeze the rest of my laugh down. Things got real strange. Instead of Rufus jabbering away at me, a mile a minute at school, he scooted around his seat, so all I could see was his back. He didn't follow me out on the playground. He acted like he didn't want my sandwiches anymore. Ever since Mama had met Rufus and I told her about sharing my sandwich with him, she had been giving me four sandwiches a day and three apples for lunch. When I saw him and Cody weren't going to come under the swing at lunchtime, I set the bag with their sandwiches and apples on it at the swing set. The bag was still there when school ended and the bell had rung. They quit sitting next to me on the bus, too, and Rufus didn't show up that night to play. After this junk went on for three or four days, I sneaked a pillowcase full of dinosaurs out and headed to over to where Rufus lived. I knocked on the door and Cody answered. I thought things might be back to being okay because Cody gave me a big smile and said, Hiya, Kenny. You want to talk to Rufus? Hi, Cody. Just a minute. Kenny closed the door and ran back inside. A minute later, Rufus came to the door. Hi, Rufus. I thought you might want to play dinosaurs. It's your turn to be the Americans. Rufus looked at the pillowcase, then back at me. I ain't playing with you no more, Kenny. How come? I knew, though. I thought you were my friend. Didn't think you was like all them other people, he said. I thought you was different. He didn't say this stuff like he was mad. He just sounded real, real sad. He pulled Cody out of the doorway and shut it. Rufus might as well have tied me to the tree and said, ready, aim, fire. I felt like someone had pulled all my teeth out with a pair of rusty pliers. I wanted to knock on his door and tell him I am different, but I was too embarrassed. So I walked the dinosaurs back home. I couldn't believe how sad I got. It's funny how things can change so much and you wouldn't notice. All of a sudden, I started remembering how much I hated riding the bus. All of a sudden, I started remembering how much lunchtime under the swing set alone wasn't very much fun. All of a sudden, I started remembering that before Rufus came to Flint, my only friend was the world's biggest dinosaur thief, L.J. Jones. All of a sudden, I remembered that Rufus and Cody were the only two kids in the whole school, other than Byron and Joey, 
that I didn't automatically look at sideways. A couple of days later, Mama asked me to sit in the kitchen with her for a while. How's school? Okay. I know she was fishing to find out what was wrong and hoped it wouldn't take her too long. I wanted to tell her what I'd done. Where's Rufus been? I haven't seen him lately. It was real embarrassing, but tears exploded down my face, and even though I knew she was going to be disappointed in me, I told Mama how I'd hurt Rufus's feelings. I hope that you have a relationship with your mom or dad or your grandma or grandmother or auntie that you could tell them things that are bothering you. Mama said, did you apologize? Sort of, but he wouldn't let me talk to him. Well, give him some time, then try again. Yes, Mama. The next day at school, when the bus pulled up at Rufus's stop, Mama was standing there. When Rufus and Cody got off, they said, Hi, Mrs. Watson, and gave her their big smiles. The three of them walked toward Rufus's house. Mama put her hand on Rufus's head while they walked. Mama didn't say anything when she got home, and I didn't ask her, but I kept my eye on the clock. At exactly 5.30, there was a knock, and I knew who it was. And I knew what I had to do. Mama and Joey were in the living room, and when they heard the knock, everything there got real quiet. Rufus and Cody were standing on the porch, smiling a mile a minute, and said, And I said, Rufus, I'm sorry. He said, That's okay. I wasn't through, though. I really wanted him to know I am different. He said, Shoot, Kenny. You think I don't know? Why you think I came back? But remember, you said it's my turn to be the Americans. People started moving around in the living room again. I guess I should have told Mama that I really appreciated her helping me get my friend back. But I didn't have to. I was pretty sure she already knew. It's nice to have friends. It's nice to treat your friends nicely. And that's a good lesson to learn from chapter three. And in case you didn't get it, the title of chapter three was The World's Greatest Dinosaur War Ever. Thank you so much for joining me today as we're reading through together the book, The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963, by Christopher Paul Curtis. Check in again for chapter four, and I'll see you then.